Welcome back, traders, to the Expert Trader Podcast Series hosted by Char Addicts. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Andrew Peters, a serial entrepreneur and successful trader. Andy, welcome to the podcast. Man, thanks so much for having me, man. I greatly appreciate it. I think this is going to be a very special episode. You got a pretty unique perspective on trading. You got a pretty unique perspective on life. And I'm really interested to kind of get you to talk to the folks at home. So could you give the folks a brief introduction into yourself? Just tell them who is Andy Peters, just for the folks that don't know you. Yeah, so my name is Andy Peters. Uh, I currently reside in Tennessee. I turned 39 years old in May. Uh, married, have three kids. Um, I'm a trader, you know, stock trader to crypto trader to Forex trader and own uh, several local businesses and invested in a few businesses nationwide. Oh, serial, I- serial entrepreneur and trader. So talk to the folks at home about your history with trading. So you said that you went from stocks to crypto. Now you're settled on Forex. Can you talk to the folks about how you started with stocks and how you kind of got into trading? Yeah, so trading's always been in my family. Um, I mean, even from like my grandfather, my dad, um, everyone was always into trading. And uh, when it come trickled down to me, I didn't want to trade. Never wanted to trade because I saw what it did to just the the family as, as a whole, whether they were, you know, trading, you know, silver and gold or, you know, anything, even in, I even look at buying houses and flipping houses as a sign of trading, you know, cause you're buying something with the cash and you're flipping, you're doing all that. So I, I saw this mentality they had their whole life and um, it, it stressed them out. Like it stressed them out or left them sitting at a desk for hours upon hours. And um, I saw them lose time with their family. I saw them lose time with friends. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I mean, it, it just wears and tears on you. And my grandfather, we lost him at a, you know, at a, a really young age because of that, but everyone had an amazing life. So that's kind of what it was looked at is like, everyone's got a good life. Let's just keep doing it. So I was like, I'll never trade a day in my life. Uh, fast forward right around 12 years, 13 years ago. Now it's 2021. I was just playing my 401k. I worked in corporate America and, you know, we had access to our fidelity account where we could go in and move things around. And I just started switching buttons, had no idea what I was really doing. And um, fast forward a week or two later, I look and I'm like, oh, I made a little bit of money. And there's no charts involved. I'm just flipping buttons and, you know, reading the news. And um, it become kind of a knack for me to where it just become natural. And then one day it clicked. So fast forward, uh, my wife's uncle, you know, he was always talking to me about Bitcoin. And I mean, I'm I'm talking about like, he's talking to me about Bitcoin when it's paper wallets, you know, I mean, it's not even, you know, mainstream stuff or anything. Nowhere even close to where it is today. It was like 2015. um, This was, uh, no, this was 20, man. 14, early 2014, I believe. Okay. I mean, like, okay. It could even be, I've, I've got my old phone right here in front of me. I was going to pull it up and it's dead because um, I still had a lot of stuff on it. But yeah, I mean, it was next to nothing. And I'm all like, dude, it's a scam. Like just, you're giving your money away to something that you can't even physically hold. And then he was like, well, you put your money in a bank account and swap a card and you don't physically hold it. And I was like, yeah, but I can go to the ATM and I can pull that cash out. Um, so kind of let things roll for a little bit. And then one day we were having a Christmas party and he was like, yo, look how much money I made. And I'm like, whatever, dude, that's nothing. You'll, you'll lose. It'll go away. So then I started tinkering around with it, so buying, you know, just a little bit here and there. And then it just, it shot off. So the big thing for me was XRP. So I got in XRP when it was 0.008 cents. Oh my God. Yeah. Loaded, loaded 10 Bitcoin worth of it. Oh my God. God. So uh, that was kind of my, my hit. And all my friends made fun of me. They're like, dude, it's not moving. It's not going anywhere. It's not doing anything. And um, I was like, it's, it's going to. And I, I really had no idea why. Because at this point in time, no one really cared. Everyone laughed about it because, you know, it, was, it wasn't in the, the cryptocurrency vision. You know, cryptocurrency is to be decentralized and to be anonymous and all this stuff. And XRP was more or less, we want to tell people who we are. We want to tell people transactions. We want to work with banks. We want to work with the government. So true cryptocurrency enthusiasts did not like XRP. Mm-hmm. But I didn't care. I was like, it, it could make money. And um, one day I wake up and, you know, I mean, it, it had made gains up to like, you know, three cents and all this stuff. And then one day it just, you know, gets to like 38, 39 cents. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. this is unreal. I've almost, you know, I've almost 38 X, you know, my money and my wife, she's like, sell, sell, sell. I'm, like, I'm going to hold to a dollar. So all my friends were like, bro, it's never going to make it to a dollar. Do you know what the market cap would be? Do you know what it'd have to do to get to a dollar? I was like, bro, it will get to a dollar. Cause I, at the time I was trading on a website called Poloniex. Poloniex had a chat box on there and everyone's just pumping it. So Poloniex was almost like the Reddit of what we're seeing today. Yep. 
they would just go in there and get people FOMO'd. When it finally got, I told everybody, you know, when it got to like a dollar fifty five, they're like, you know, sounds like I'm holding out for two bucks. And I just kept being greedy. And um, I'll never forget when it got to two dollars and thirteen cents, I just market ordered, sold it, and got out. So you sold all of it? Every bit of it. Today on the day that we're recording this, XRP is up twenty seven percent from yesterday's close. Um, so that's honestly insane. So there's a lot of questions that I have here, but walk me through the decision making of you chose not to sell, not to sell. And then eventually you had that point where you were like, you know what, this is a comfortable place for me. Walk us through that uh, decision making process. Because the money was unreal. It, it was finally at a point to where it's like, I can't have greed anymore. I mean, this is the, I mean, you're talking 266 X my money. Yeah, that's a hell of a return. Well, I shared a screenshot within my Telegram group that I have of me and my buddy, Nick. Uh, we actually shared just a trading account together. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at one point in time on Poloniex, we had almost 6,000 Bitcoin on there. My God. Okay, so <laughs> so walk me through after the Ripple, after you sold the Ripple, did you stay in the crypto world? Did you walk away from yeah. corporate America for good? Like what, what really happened after that Ripple move? So I stayed, um, I took all the ones from Ripple and then started dumping into Tron and just all these crap coins. And um, I actually rode Tron all the way up to 30 something cents or 28 cents in a live meeting because it, it, it all pumped the same day, basically. And um, I ended up getting now, I think, like 13 cents, which was still one heck of a ride. Um, but did um, I actually sent a chart out this morning of the ones that I was in and it was... Um, yeah, we just would buy stuff like a lottery ticket. It's like throw one BTC in your top 20 coins. Because back then, Bitcoin's not costing you anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it really didn't matter. So, yeah, I mean, we're talking we were, anything from, you know, CND, DMD, Storm, Bat, ADX, Knowles, ARC, VTC, Dragon, Neo, Strat, then ADA, XRP, XLM. I mean, everything. You can't really see it that well, but yeah. I mean, so are you, okay, this is kind of, we're going to get back on track here. I kind of want to hear how about, about how you, how you transitioned from <clears throat> crypto to the Forex game, but are you still involved in cryptocurrencies now? Did you I sort am. of walk away for good back then or? So that was, it was really hitting hard in 2017. And I was like, I really want to bring a group together. So I started a company called, well, not more, not a company, a group called Chatted Crypto. And it spread like wildfire because we started in 2017. So that's when the market's just bullish as can be. Everyone and their mom was becoming a member of it. And it got to a point where we actually uh, leased an office in downtown Chattanooga. I mean, overlooking the city. I mean, super nice office, all glass offices. I mean, we were taking this to the moon. And, um, you know, Fox News got a hold of it. The local newspaper got a hold of it. People from Atlanta was getting a hold of it. And they were doing interviews left and right, which was my fault. Because then they started FOMOing even more people then. And I'm telling people, like, don't buy anything. Don't do anything else. Like, this is not, this is really isn't the time to get in. Now, we had a few people that wanted to, you know, buy different, like, altcoins and stuff to help pump. But Bitcoin, in December, I put a chart on Facebook with a, a box showing where Bitcoin was going to go. And I said, we're about to break. It's tanking down. This is where we're going. If you don't want to lose all your money, get out. And um, it hit it. It hit it within 118 bucks. Um, as far as where I was going with it. And after that, people just lost interest because so many people bought at mm -hmm. 18,000. So many people invested. And I told them, this is long-term. Like not everything's going to hit same day, same year, all this stuff. And that's kind of a, a fault of people like myself and traders that get excited. We post this stuff on social media because we're excited, but then the average Joe doesn't know this isn't the time to buy. You know, they just buy because they see us post about it. Um, so after that, man, 2018 came and people just, you know, they got disgusted, got out of crypto. I mean, I'm still in it. I'm still playing with it. I'm still buying Bitcoin on the way down. I'm still having fun with it. Um, and I think I basically washed my hands of everything probably August of 2018. August 2018, I was like, I'm done with, with crypto. I'm done with talking to people about it. I'm just going to make random posts on social media, you know, once every three or four months here and there. Well, then in 2019, you know, we had our big run towards the end of the year. And then 2020 came and I made a post on um, Instagram and it was like $3,849 in Bitcoin. And I said, if you want to 400% increase your portfolio, buy Bitcoin today. I've seen that on your Instagram. It's still That's on my Instagram. Right? 
Uh, well, it was on a story, uh, but I did throw it, I think, up in a post or something, possibly. And uh, I put it in my Telegram group. I put it everywhere. I even went live. Dude, I had never received so many hate messages in my life. They're like, bro, people are going to lose money. They're going to lose their houses. They're going to do this. And I'm like, I'm just telling you, if you want to buy Bitcoin, you better buy it now. For sure. And when it finally hit, when it finally hit 16,000, I think it was like 800 or something like that. I was like, yo, we just 4 x our money. This is what it's about. I did not think we would go above 24,000. I honestly didn't. And when it went above it, I was like, well, here we are. We're along for the ride. So that's exciting. So how did you get into Forex? So from the crypto times to where you were trading in and out of these coins to when you officially walked away 2018, you were talking about it in 2019, 2020. Walk us through uh, where Forex came into the picture. Forex kind of fell into it. Um, I was online one day and a buddy tagged me in Q's post. Q had made a post with an MT4 and I'd never seen an MT4 before, ever. This was in um, probably August of 2019, give or take. Um, never seen an MT4 before. I'm talking nothing. And I saw it, I was like, what is this? So I started looking at Q's profile and um, I was like, man, this dude's making a lot of fake money. You know, like I didn't think it, I didn't think it was, you know, like it's, it's probably, you know, got some kind of conversion or something doing, you know, whatever. I didn't think that, that it was real because I'd never heard of, it. I mean, I'd heard of Forex before, but I'd heard of it in terms of IML, you know, getting people signed up, tra you know, I'd never seen, I was like, and who is this guy? <clears throat> so then I start watching his videos, excuse me, <clears throat> start watching his videos. And I'm like, whoa, this is a real dude. Like he's, he's actually giving out information. He's actually putting stuff out there. And I was like, well, I'm going to download an MT4 and just play with it. So I downloaded an MT4, played with a demo account. Bro, I was, I was confused as heck. I didn't know what was going on. And I'm like, you just click one, like you run 1.0. That's a dollar. So I open up a demo account, I think with like 100K. I run a 1.0, don't make any money. I'll lose money. And I was like, well, if I play with 100K, that's really not tight. Let's bring it down. So I bring it down to like a $10,000 account. Dude, I blew that demo account in like two days. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. So I just started researching it and I started studying, watching a few YouTube videos and found out what lot sizes mean. Um, you know, how they do spreads. Because in four, I mean, in crypto, you don't have a spread. You've got fees and you've got a bid and ask, which is technically your spread. But you can also mark it if you want to. You know, in Forex, you can mark it and it's going to throw you in, but you still have your spread with your broker or whoever. I didn't understand any of that stuff. So after probably, I'd say maybe two and a half weeks of playing, I deposited some real money into it. And um, then the real money started taking off. And I was like, this is easy. Like, this is too easy. It's an ATM in your hand. And I think the first, the first big flip I ever did, I went ahead and deposited 4,800 bucks. And in a month and a half, I'd taken it to almost, I think 20 K and some change. And I was like, okay, this is easy. Like you, you click buttons, you chart it out. Now, when that's you're how learning, I, fell into it. I didn't mean to cut you off. When you're learning this stuff, no, no, the beginning, did you go out there and find courses? Were you watching free videos? What, what were you really doing <laughs> to kind of put yourself in the, you know, in the right place to succeed? So the only thing that I really need, because coming from a charting background already, the only thing I needed to see was what is an MT4? Like how, how does MT4 differ from any of the other, other tra trading platforms that I used? And then the big thing was the brokers is what broker, you know, do I use? What broker do I trade with? Who is the best, excuse me, who is the best broker? And then you start seeing stuff like, well, don't use this one because this broker is a scam. Don't use this broker because this broker is going to steal your money. Don't use this broker because, and it's like, there was just so much information I had to digest. I wasn't really researching for the how to trade. It was more or less how to use an MT4 and then what brokers are going to be your best broker. That was it. Like that was, that was all I studied. I did buy um, Ron uh, Gilpin's uh, package. I bought it and then um, it's Forex Austin. I don't know if you remember him. I ended up getting one of his packages. Just, I mean, I never made it through the, the classes because a lot of the stuff that they were talking about was stuff that I already knew as a trader. And it, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like there's going to be this, you know, holy grail that pops off. And it was like, man, you know, what they're talking about, they're reiterating, reiterating what I already know. I need to polish up on this. So, I mean, both great classes, great courses. Um, and I just kind of jumped in head first and then made a relationship with um, Anthony. And um, Anthony kind of just, you know, polished me up a little bit because uh, I was kind of wild on my trading side. 
And then after that, um, hooked up with my buddy Brad and Jeff and started trading with them. And it just kind of, it just snowballed. I, I fell into it. There was no, I, I had no intentions of ever trading Forex. So, okay. So let's fast forward no, to today. How would you describe your trading style today? So you said that there was a lot of stuff you already knew from trading uh, cryptocurrencies, trading stocks. How would you describe your trading style today in Forex? Are you a swing trader? Are you a scalper? Like I've, I'm, I would say I'm more of a swing trader. Um, 90% of the time. Uh, I do scalp a lot of like US 30 um, and play with it a ton, but I, I'm more of an interest, you know, intra a little bit of the time, but mostly just swing. And that comes from, you know, the stocks and Forex background. I mean, stocks and crypto background, because you're just holding stuff. You buy things, you chart it up and you know where it's going long-term and you're waiting for it. So that same mentality kind of, you know, transpired over to the whole Forex side. So for a lot of people who are uncomfortable with swinging, I feel like the most you gotta say swing is, uh, is probably holding and drawdown. So how do you think about holding a drawdown as a swing trader? So drawdown doesn't affect me at all because I was part of the 2018 crypto movement. All right. <laughs> no. That's fair enough. <laughs> no, I think um, I think the big thing a lot of people have to focus on is if you're uncomfortable with the drawdown that you're in, then chances are you're over leveraged. Ah, okay. Major key right there. And if you're if you're over leveraged and you're uncomfortable with that drawdown. And you're like, well, okay, I need to correct my leverage. So then you use a correct, you know, leverage position as far as, you know, maybe you don't, maybe you need to enter this on a half a standard instead of five standards. Okay. If that half a standard gets you uncomfortable and you've got a decent size account, then it means the trade went the opposite way. You should already been out of that trade a long time ago. And then right. that just comes to creating your own set of trading rules. Okay. So let's get, we'll talk about risk management later. I think that was really important what you just said. But let's talk about you real quick. Talk to us about Pip Connect and how that came about. So Pip Connect came about because I love I love teaching and I love watching this. I love watching people grow, and um, I wanted to create a community of where I could get people to come in and, and trade and ask questions. Um, I could be kind of hands on with them. Um, so originally Pip Connect was just uh, me one on ones, and then inviting people to my Telegram group, and I kind of just was like, you know what, let's just make this free. So open it up free for four months, uh, let everyone get in, still have the free telegram. So I still have the free telegram, you don't have to pay for that. But then I still have now the Pip Connect VIP, which is more, uh, you know, private telegram group, private meetups, um, Zooms twice a week. And it's not, sometimes it's not just teachings. Sometimes it's just the psychology of, of trading. There's people that get in their own head and they're like, I don't need help trading. I need help with how I think. Like I've run risk management for three weeks and then all of a sudden I've blown my account because I went in heavy. Why did I go in heavy? And you start going into the microscopic details and they went in heavy because their girlfriend wanted to go out on a vacation later this year. And they're like, I need to make the money now. It's like, well, your girlfriend right, just blew your so that's, I think the most important takeaway from that is that a lot of people really aren't struggling with the technical side. It really is the decision making and sort of getting their, I want to say their expectations and the reality of trading kind of back in check. Oh yeah, all day. I mean, well, you just hit it on the head with what you said. I went through your website and on the website, you say something very interesting. You say the trading environment is clouded by smoke and mirrors. What does that really mean? And what smoke and mirrors do you feel like the trading industry is sort of clouded by? People, people are the smoke and mirrors. Let's call out some people real quick. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't have any beef with anyone. So the oh, smoke man. and mirrors, the smoke and mirrors are going to be what people think is because everyone looks at where Q is at now. All the eyes are on Q. And well, I say all the eyes are on Q. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say but the eyes are on everyone. But I mean, Q is the one that's got two matching Lambos. He's the one that's got the great lifestyle. He's the one like he's a dad. I mean, there's so much going on for Q that when you talk about Forex, he's kind of the one that, you know, pops up. I mean, that, that's just, you know, what people talk about. And when you look at his lifestyle, and also as I say this too, because he's the most um, that's had the Instagram post for so long. Like if you go to Anthony's profile, you know, it's not as heavy with the post as Q is. The same goes for, you know, Daniel or anyone else. It's not as heavy as far as like the timelines that go back. So when you go to Q's, you can go all the way back to where this dude is sitting there in a, a Volkswagen. Well, people look at where he's at now and they're like, he got there overnight. He went from making $100,000 a knot to now a million dollars a week. So they think they can do that same thing. 
they think they can wake up and take a thousand dollar account to a million dollars. And for the masses, that doesn't happen. Well, what they have to do is they have to look back and they, they see the pattern of which Q made. And I mean, he, you see it, like you can watch it. If someone put a, a reel together of all of his Instagram posts, it, it's almost like just seeing the growth of someone just do this, you know? And I think that's something people miss out on is this growth. They just look at the last year or they look at the last six months and it's not, you just can't make that happen overnight. Um, so that's one side of the smoke and mirrors, but he's not creating that. That's what people are creating their own perception of, you know, what Q has done has been phenomenal going to working from target to where he's at now. Amazing. You look at Anthony's story um, from going from a high school dropout to where he's at now. Amazing. You look at Daniel's story, washing cars, like legit washing cars, making tips to where he's at now. You know, you look at Ron's story, you look at anyone's story and it's like, that's amazing. But everyone doesn't see the whole picture. They just see what, what they think happens overnight. And then the other side to that are the demo traders. The, and, I, and I know some of these because I've seen them. I went to a big meetup in Atlanta um, on the Forex industry, but I know it transpires into the Forex industry. It was a big crypto meetup. And, you know, this dude's showing up in his new Lambo, his girlfriend's driving a Ferrari and all this stuff. And my buddy does all of his photography for him. So at this point in time, he just shoots all the photography. And I was like, dude, he's really loaded up in the last three months. He goes, man, let me tell you a little secret. He's like, you see that bag over there? And I was like, yeah, he said, that bag's full of clothes. He's like, we're going to shoot probably 3,000 photos and a couple of hours of video. And he's going to use that footage on social media for the next year. Whoa. This dude would change outfits and Whoa. take photos of him and his car on the bridge, change photos and take a picture of him and his girlfriend walking out of a restaurant, change, I mean, change clothes, walk out of the mall at Lenox Square, change clothes for him driving down the road. And that's what he posted all year on social media was from that one take. And then he become a recluse the rest of the year. Like when I started digging into it, this dude would literally lock himself in an apartment. He didn't even live in Atlanta because he didn't want people to know that. So he would dip out of Atlanta. He lived in Charlotte and he would lock himself in his apartment, not even go out because he was in Dubai. Whoa. Okay. So if you guys are getting distracted, the smoke by, and if they're getting distracted by the smoke and mirrors on Instagram, let that, let that be the number one lesson for you guys that you never know what's ha what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so if somebody's looking at this, Andy, and they're kind of saying, well, I do want to become like Hugh Banks one day. I do want to get like Anthony one day. What should they really be focused on? If they're not focusing so much on the actual end result, what should they be doing to actually get to that so, point one day? Focus on themselves. Because at the end of the day, no one's going to mimic Q's results. And at the end of the day, no one's going to, they're not going to get the same results that Anthony got. At the end of the day, they're not going to mimic my results. They're not going to mimic Daniel's results. They're not going to mimic any of them because at the end of the day, we are all different people with a different mindset. And that different mindset is the psychology aspect that keeps you from getting to the next level. I mean, I've taken same trades as other people and they've lost those trades that I've won. Literally click buy at the same time. So how did I win? How did they lose? The psychology aspect. They may have been in too much drawdown, got out of the trade. Or the trade went up, they got greed, held it too long, and it came back down to their entry point. You know, so no, no person's going to get the same results as the next person when it comes to their lifestyle. And you got to look at the drive. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a lot of people that will will put all into learning Forex. And then there's some people that won't because they don't have the time. They want to watch Netflix. They want to play video games. They want to go out on dates. They want to watch football games. They want to do these things. While they're doing that, someone else is grinding, studying. Someone is studying the charts. Someone's staying up late watching, you know, session overlap to see what happens, to see how price action changes. And I mean, I even see that within my own group now. I've got people where I'm like, have you, have you finished studying the material that I sent you? Bro, I've been busy all day. I've been busy for the last two weeks. I've not had time to do anything. I get my phone out and I start going through their Facebook and their Instagram. And I'm like, well, it looks like here you went out and partied. It looks like here you and your girlfriend went out on a date. Well, bro, I've got to live. Well, you do have to live. But if you're telling me you don't have time to put into something that's going to make you money, you're never going to have time.
you know? So I think looking at, looking at other people on social media is good for motivation, but looking at them to try to get to their level is it's kind of a pop dream. You know, it, it's like, there's not many people that are going to make a million dollars in a day. There's not many people that's going to make a million dollars in a week, you know? So you got to set your own goals up and say, okay, how much do you have to invest? You've got a thousand dollars. Okay. With a thousand dollars, aim to make 50 bucks a week and make a, and make 50 bucks a week for the next six months. And then after that, try to make, I mean, $50 a day, you know, and then after that, try to make maybe a hundred dollars a day, a hundred dollars a week, depending on your risk management. And then before you know it, that $1,000 turns into 3000, that 3000 turns into 10,000. And it may take four or five years, but people don't want to do that. They want to deposit a hundred bucks and it turn into a million dollars in a year. All right. So very well said, let's step away from the mentorship. Let's step away from trading for a little bit. Well, not really trading. This is kind of still trading related. Can you walk me through what Carbon Capital is? Yeah, so Carbon Capital, it's a new broker that started up uh, October of last year. And um, I've been talking, you know, to, to some of the team and, and people that help run it and stuff. And I was like, man, I would really like to be part of this. You know, I'd really like to trade on your platform and just work hands on with you guys. And um, they were like, come on board. So I, I came on board, started trading with, you know, their, their broker. And then from that point, uh, they're like, you know what? You've really got a good hand in the community with your Telegram group. Um, do you care to kind of be our point of contact? Do you know, if anyone needs help, if anyone needs help with the broker, if anyone needs help with trading, do you kind of care to be that guy? And I was like, not one bit. Um, so then that kind of transpired into me being the online face, um, you know, for Carbon. Um, and then obviously they do like a lot of other brokers and have IB programs and stuff. Um, so brought on a few, inter, you know, IBs on the other end, started working with them. And now here we are. So I, I like them. I like, yeah, I like trading with them because I know their backstory. Um, I like the the company as a whole. Um, and I know, I know where my money's sitting at, you know, that, that's kind of the big thing for me. So what are the most important things for you? Cause I know that you kind of struggled with um, figuring out what broker to use when you were first starting trading. What do you think is the most, are the most important considerations that someone should look for in a brokerage yeah, when they're I mean, signing up fits to trade? their style? You know, is, are you trading with no commissions? Are you trading with a lower spread? Um, you know, if you're a scalper, you may not want a flat commission rate. You know, if you're a scalper, you may be willing to take, you know, the spread because you're, you're in and out and you know where your points are going to be. Um, or you may be someone's like, you know what? I don't care what the commissions are. You know, I care more about the spread. I mean, you know, and then finding out which one supports the way you deposit, you know, who supports withdrawals. Um, I mean, there's just... I mean, even lagging. I mean, there's some where, you know, the brokers just lag because server time is so slow. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it and it's kind of by trial and error that you just find what, what works for you. Okay. That's fair enough. Andy, biggest thing about this podcast is we're trying to cater to traders that might just be starting out. So I kind of want to go through a segment, uh, tips for new traders. I just want to kind of fire off some questions for you. Um, the first one would be what key habits do you think that every new trader should develop? in order to have success, not just in the short term, but also in the long term, if they want to stay in trading? Journal. Journal everything. And that was one thing I found that was always key to my style of, of trading was, and when I say journal every, I mean, you don't have to get too, I've always journaled my whole life. I, I've wrote journal because I've got kids and, you know, I'm afraid one day if something happened to me, I want them to know what dad felt. You know, I want them to know what did daddy think about this day of you at the park? So I've journaled everything. Um, but when it came to trading, I journaled because, I would see, okay, on this day, I lost trades. On this day over here, I lost trades. What was a common denominator? And I'd go back and look and I'm like, ah, common denominator was I went out the night before on both of these days, which means I probably didn't sleep good. I probably didn't eat well the next morning. I was probably foggy in the brain. Okay, so if I go out and party the night before, I'm not going to trade the next day. Fair enough. Okay, what did I do on these days that I won? What did I do? You know, and you start saying on the days that I won, I had a really good day prior. I slept good the night before. I woke up and maybe went outside and played with the kids. And you start seeing these common denominators, and then you can use that to build your trading rule book. And I think everyone, so you got the journal, and then you've got your rule book. So like for me, the rules are, you know, you're not going to go out and party the night before and trade the next day. You know, if you've got something big happening day up, you're not going to trade because you can rush trades. So like if we've got a birthday party for one of our kids on a Friday, I'm not going to trade on Friday because we're going to be prepared for a birthday. We're going to be out going around moving. There's going to be moving parts and my mind's not going to be where it needs to be. 
So journaling creates the habit of having the trading rule book. Okay. So that's my first thing. That's awesome. Journaling and, and having then, a rule book. And then, and then the only other thing I would add to that is, you know, fall into the proper risk management. That's massive. All right. So first, so what, if you guys are listening to this and you're sort of just getting into trading, um, you're going to hear a lot of different things from all the podcast guests, but the number one thing that's consistent is to make sure that you guys are being responsible and treating this seriously, which is, you know, making sure that you're journaling, you have a set of, you know, uh, like a system for yourself that you're not just sort of gambling in the markets. Very yep. important. So what do you see something that's consistent that new traders constantly fall into? What are Over some traps that you see new traders fall into? Over leveraging. Over leverage. I mean, it's, that's the, if you look at any single person that's losing, tra there's no one that's trading a thousand dollar account, trading pennies that are blowing accounts. And if they are, well, they need to stop trading and start studying. So it, okay. it, it always comes back to over leveraging every single time. Okay. What's something that you see experienced traders falling into? Ooh, um, I can't speak on anyone else's behalf except for Anthony's because he's an experienced trader and it, and it's me the same way. It always falls into when we're just risking it for the biscuit, you know, where you've got a hundred thousand dollars sitting there. That's house money. And you're like, I'm going all in whether it goes this direction or not, we're going all in. But at that point, it's like, do you really care about that loss? You don't because you're, you're risking it just having fun. So, you know, it's from that point of view, um, you know, that's something we laugh about and joke about, about just risking accounts and blowing them to try to flip them and all that. From my own perspective over being a, a decent trader, something that I struggle with is the balance. Um, it was the balance of life with my family and trading. That was the hardest part. Um, because like, if you trade, most people trade because they won't, a majority of people trade because they want freedom and they want nice things. Okay. But if you're sitting in front of this computer for 16 hours a day, you really don't have freedom and you're not enjoying the nice things you have. You're super car sitting in a garage and you're sitting at a desk. So you've got to have that balance of, I want to enjoy life. I want to have nice things. And I also want to trade. And that's the thing that I see a lot of good traders struggle with is, you know, we'll meet up and I'm like, so man, what'd your week look like, bro? I sit in front of the computer 12, 13 hours a day, five days this week. Wow. Trading. So you didn't go do anything? No, nah, man, I was trying to catch the moose. And what you find is you start getting cloudy that way. And then your trading really doesn't get that great because you're looking at the charts so long, your eyes are burned out, your, your brain's gone. You're just like, then you're just trying to find a move. And I feel like you're forcing the charts, you know? Sure. All right. So talk to me about your opinion on um, taking signals versus somebody trading for themselves. How do you feel about so, both? Um, I mean, I think signals are, are good and you can learn a lot from signals uh, because it's giving you a, an entry point. It's giving you a take profit point. And if you chart it up and look at it and then watch to see what happens and learn from it, I think signals are great. People that take signals from just copy and paste and never look at a chart, never do anything, just throw them in there and they lose and they win and all that. I, I don't think they're learning anything from that. And you're depending on someone else. So think about this. Let's say, let's say I was taking signals and I'm living a good life off of signals. Like I was able to quit, quit my nine to five. I've got nice cars. We got nice houses and all this stuff. And then the person giving me signals dies in a car crash my entire existence of the current life I have is gone. It's gone. My signal provider, which is my ATM, is dead. So now what do I do? Find another signal group? What about if they suck? It's like, I, I, don't want my, I don't want my wealth to be in the hands of someone else. So if you learn to grade, you don't have to depend on anyone else giving you signals and, and getting you there. But like I said, I think they're great. And I think there's a good place for them. Like, you know, if you can take a signal market up and look at it and see what it did, you can learn from that. But copying and pasting, I don't, I just don't think you're, you're relying your wealth in someone else's hands that may not always be there. All right. Well said.
So talk to me about your take on it. This is the last one of the, this kind of spitfire round. Then I kind of want to just wrap up the podcast with some tips for the new guys. Um, what do you think about having a mentor versus not having a mentor? And so I know it kind of seems like an obvious question, but a lot of people say that when you have a mentor, it kind of guides you in a way where you're not really learning from the market, trial and error, stuff like that. So there's, there's two opposing thoughts there. What do you think about having a mentor versus kind of figuring this out on your own? I think you've got to have the correct mentor. You've got to have a mentor that not just looks at you for a trader. You've got to have a mentor that looks at you for your life. And life as a whole mean your wealth, your health, you know, your family, um, physical, psychology, everything about you has to be on point. So um, for myself, um, I've always had a mentor, always. Uh, when I say always, from the time I was, I used to race dirt bikes. Um, and that was kind of my, my big thing. I started that when I was like, I'm talking six, seven years old. And even when I was, when I turned 10, things started getting really serious in dirt bikes. So I had a coach then, and then I started having mentors. Um, so even now I'm 30, 38, turned 39 in May. I still have a loft coach. And it's not because I have to have one, but it's always good to have someone that's not in your, that's not in your box. Look at your life and the things that you do and give their opinion because they're looking from the outside looking in. So we may think things are going great because we're in the box, but then someone looking outside is going, man, your life's a wreck. You need to fix this. You need to fix that. You need to get this in order. Um, So I've always had that. So I think that's really important as far as a a, a trading mentor. I've never had a trading mentor. Um, I do look at Anthony as being a big mentor though for me um, because he, he always, you know, took that time. Um, I mean, he's been on FaceTime with me five, six hours before just talking about things, showing me things I was doing wrong with my charts. Like when I was first trading crypto side, my chart, my trading view looked like a clown was murdered on it. I mean, there was so much going on. And um, Anthony stripped, you know, everything away, threw out some trend lines here and there, showed me zones. He's like, that's all you need. And I was like, that's it. He's like, yeah, and if you can learn that, you're going to be successful. And I was like, eh, I don't know. And it worked. And now, I mean, that, that's how I trade. So, I mean, I look at him. Um, as a mentor, my buddy, um, Brad and Jeff, um, they're real big mentors of mine. Um, they came in from a company that I used to work with called FXA mentors. And that was their big thing was mentoring people. Okay. Um, so I mean, I still talk to them every single day. So I look at them as mentors, but I mean, like I, it's someone that I'm checking in with every single day is my life coach. Just because if your life's doing good, everything else is going to be well. If you and your wife are doing well, your trading will be good. If you and your kids have a great relationship, your trading is going to be good. I mean, if you feel good, your trading is going to be good. It, it's the people that are trying to rush things who are trying to catch up in life that I found that make the biggest mistakes because they're trying to get to that elite level of trading or catch up with, you know, the, the Q Bankses and Raul's and Anthony and Savages and all those people. And they're just trying to rush it too fast. You know, I think that's why you have someone to slap important. that hand and calm you down. Very well said. So there's the last part of this. I kind of just want to walk through life after Forex, right? So I kind of just want to talk about life, not really after Forex, but outside of Forex. How can people sort of transition to doing other things with their trading? And I want to talk to you about your businesses. I want to talk about Fit Plus Meals. um, And I want to ask you about Thrive Global. If you can just talk about those two things. So, well, Fit Plus Meals, I mean, that's, that's our restaurant meal prep company and everything that we do. Um, something that I'm very, very involved in um, because I just love, I mean, think about this. I love seeing people happy. I mean, have you ever seen someone sit down at a table and eat a pizza and they're in a bad mood? No, (laughs) everyone always gets happy when they eat. So, you know, being in that environment, um, I love it. And it's a way for me to put money, you know, into something, invest in, and then get that return back. Um, And the same goes for, like I said, life after Forex is when you get involved in businesses or you do something outside of it, there's many of us traders that don't just trade, you know, we use our money to then make us other money. So if you make, say you make a thousand dollars, you know, here and there, and you're able to fi- save up five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars buy an ATM machine, buy an ATM machine, throw it somewhere. And then that's going to make you 250, $300 every single month. You know, this is coming in. Um, or you can do like Anthony does and you've got extra money and you go to businesses and you're like, Hey, I want to invest in your business. And then you invest in that business or then you buy up stuff. You, you get involved in the real estate. I mean, there's, there's so many other ways to make your money work for you. And then it's like, Oh, I made a hundred K 
okay, well, if you made 100K and then you put that 100K into something else, now you're going to make even more money. You know, like I've got one trader um, that I mentor and he made enough money to buy some real estate. So he bought an office building. And now that office building is paying him $12,500 a month hands-free. So, you know, granted, he won't make his full profit until about six years down the road. But still, after six years, it's all free money. So it's, it's just a way of getting your money working for you. For sure. Okay, so, so is that something that is pretty common with the traders that you've seen you work with? Or do you see traders kind of getting bogged down into sticking with trading? The reason I ask this is that people tend to think that trading is a lifestyle, which is that the better you get, the more that you trade, and you can kind of make more money doing that. Um, versus the main key is to kind of take the money away from Forex and to go do things like live life and to actually invest in things outside of the trading. Is that how you view it? Oh, yep. That's exactly how I view it because it can really start to get in your head if you're trading every single day and you're relying on that because then you think I've got to make X amount of money every day to survive. You know, I mean, imagine, imagine if you've got 26,000 to even a hundred thousand dollars worth of bills a month, you know, you've got to make that money trading. So then it's forcing you to be on the charts. It's forcing you to make those trades. But if your money is working for you outside the charts, you continue using Forex as the building block or stocks or crypto or whatever you want to get you to that next level, you know, or to add more real estate under your belt. And it's, it's just a great tool. I mean, it, it's an amazing tool when you need money. I mean, there's nowhere else you can go and say, okay, I need $20,000. If you know how to trade and you got the proper account, let's say you trade a hundred thousand dollar account, you know, you got to make 20%. I mean, for last month, I made 153%. So it's like you can start to, to realize what buttons you can push, how hard you can push them, and you can almost just make your own money. But you can't thrive on that every single day. Okay, that's really well said. I kind of just had one last, this is not the last question, but this kind of just came to mind. Uh, we talked about risk management a lot. How do you think about risk management now? And then um, how did that change over time? Because I know that you used to have a certain mindset about risk management versus now. Could you just walk us through how your mindset yeah. shifted? So I'm a big account. I'm a big account flipper. I mean, that's my thing. I love, like, I can flip the heck out of an account, but I always blow it because I start getting, I'm like, oh, it's free money. Um, like, we had the retreat uh, with my crew, uh, actually, and we all did this you know, challenge of how far can anyone take a $3,000 account from a Thursday night to Friday market close. And um, I took mine to like 36,000 and some change. And then I just went all in, got in too many positions and I lost all of it. And I've been, I've been, I've been something I'm guilty of religiously is because I look at it as house money. You know, I'll take a $10,000 account to 70 and I'm like, so it has to be 60K. So then I just gamble away 60K. And sometimes I win and sometimes I lose. Um, so that was kind of always, that was almost like my trading style was that. I mean, I would go on US 30 and just go nuts with it. And it's like, you know what? You're wasting a lot of money. Like you're literally throwing money just back out into the space. So let's slow this down a bit. So then, okay, if I trade a $100,000 account and I want to risk 3% per trade, and I can take a trade, three thousand, you know, three thousand dollar risk. So I'll go in stop loss, calculate stop the risk, and pick away, and then I can look at my standards and go from there and enter it. And if it goes negative three thousand dollars, it hits my stop loss, it closes me out. So, so that's kind of how I look at the the risk management side of it is just calculating the percentages of your total overall account, and then looking at where your stop loss or your zone or prior zone is going to be, and then calculate that into your own um, entry point. Now you recently, I don't know if how recent this was, you took a, maybe you can walk us through the story, uh, the $500,000 <laughs> account and kind of where that started and how that went. Yeah, so it was started, um, I was on a Zoom one night and we were just talking about accounts in general, how if you used semi proper risk management, you could build an account over time. Um, and then if you just kind of, blew it all away and risked it all, you could go some crazy numbers. So I was like, well, right now, if I go crazy and I trade two to three days a week, 
I can average about 20 to 25% on those trades, give or take. So that's almost 75% a week, which would be an account flip. So I was like, if I can do 20K and turn into 40, and then the 40 into 80, the 80 into the 160, and the 160 into 320, I mean, that's within a month. Um, and I just, I had no intentions of it going that far. Mm-hmm. I just started pushing buttons and trading and made it happen. And it was funny because once I got into the $300,000 range, um, everyone was like, bro, you're going to blow it. You're going to blow it. I was like, well, this is where it gets easy. When you're trading with more capital, it makes it easy then because 10% is 30K. It's easy to do a 10% trade. Where it gets in their head is the loss sizes. Because when you're trading you know, a $300,000 account, you're not taking a standard to get your 10 to 20%. You're dropping 10 standards, 15 standards, 50 standards. And that can get with people's heads because they start seeing that drawdown. You start seeing drawdown of $18,000. <laughs> you start getting a little squirmish, you know? Um, so I never intended on taking it that far. And then when I did, all the trades were closed. There was no more open trades. It was done. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to risk this one anymore. It was because at one point I was in like 60% drawdown on like 400 K. Oh my God. Yeah. That is insane. That's an insane story. I hope you guys <laughs> paid attention to that. It's on Andy's <laughs> Instagram page. If you guys want to go check that out. Uh, Andy, I really appreciate you stopping by. Do you have any final tips for new traders or for traders in general, things to focus on, just most important things that (laughs) you think could help them in their journey? Focus on what you want trading to be for you. That's the big thing. Is trading to you replace a nine to five job? Is trading to you, you know, paying for your house payment, your mortgage? Um, Find out what trading means to you. Don't don't use trading as a, a crutch to like, I want a, I want a Lambo. I want a Ferrari. I want, you know, the $2 million house because you're, those things are nice, but you're going to stress yourself out heavily trying to get there. It's easier to say, I want to create a Forex platform, my own trading, you know, style, which I consider like your platform. So like the platform that I trade, I just want to be successful and you build it up piece by piece. In my modest car, focus on utilizing Forex to pay those things off, to get out of the debt. And then once you're zero out of debt altogether, then focus on just building and stacking your accounts. Um, And don't waste all of your money on those things. I've seen some very successful traders, very successful that I personally know, make massive withdrawals to buy a car. And all their money's gone. They don't even have trading capital Like they had enough money in their trading account to buy this car. They buy that car and now they don't even have the money to trade. And I'm like, how are you going to pay for the car? Bro, I paid for it. It's paid off. How are you paying for that insurance? I mean, I can, I can make a thousand dollars a month easy on all this stuff. I can make 800 a month just to pay cover gas insurance, oil changes. But what about life? Like wouldn't it have been smarter to 200, $250,000 and just taking out 10% a month and continue trading that to make more money? No, bro, I wanted the car now. It's like, I think that mentality is just what wrecks, you know, so many new traders is compounding your account balance, paying yourself. I mean, you want to make a withdrawal. You do want to make a withdrawal to pay yourself because if you're not paying yourself, you don't feel like you're making money. And when people say, you know, I've got 80K in my trading account, so I'm $80,000 profit, you're not. You're not $80,000 profit till you got $80,000 in your bank account. That MT4 can say whatever it wants all day. Until it's in your bank account, you've not made that money because you can blow that money just as fast as you made it. So that's my takeaway. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Andrew Peters stops by the Expert Trader Podcast hosted by Char Addicts. All links and information to get to Andy are going to be posted in the comments below. Let us know what you guys thought about this podcast. Andy, I really appreciate you for stopping by. Thank you. Dude, I appreciate you having me and just thanks so much. It was a privilege.